I'm Mother Jan Nunley from St. Peter's Church in Peekskill. Despite the fact that Christmas carols and decorations have been all over the place since the day after Thanksgiving, if not before, I'm not sure how many people really understand what Christmas is and what it represents to those who have called themselves Christians for more than 2,000 years. Not so much Santa Claus or presents under the tree, but the gift of a whole new kind of life. The earliest Christians were the followers of a first century Jewish teacher and healer named Yeshua, or as we might pronounce it, Joshua, or as a Greek might say it, Jesus. In his short career of just three years, he made quite a stir in what was then called Palestine, an occupied territory of the Roman Empire. Reports circulated of his healing the desperately ill, the blind, the deaf, the disabled. Stories were even told of the dead coming to life under his touch. His popularity and his reputation for wisdom grew to the point that the secular and religious authorities became fearful that their own political power might be put in jeopardy. So they arranged for his judicial murder on trumped up charges of treason and blasphemy hoping that the disappointed crowds of his followers would disperse for good. But what no one expected was that three days after his public execution and hasty burial in a borrowed tomb, he would be seen walking and talking and even eating with his followers, still bearing the scars of his torture and his brutal murder, but alive in a strange new way not just resuscitated back into normal human life, but resurrected in a body that transcended everyday human existence. Word of these odd bodily reappearances spread like wildfire. They were seen as proof of what some had been saying all along, that this Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, the Anointed One, the fulfillment of a promise that God had made centuries before to return to his people, to release them from the terrible grip of sin and death, and to remake the entire creation. But that kind of sounds like Easter. And what does that have to do with Christmas? Well, as it turns out, everything. Other stories emerged about Jesus' early life. Tales of angelic beings appearing to members of his family, bearing strange messages about his unusual conception and birth. Stories of a stable and shepherds and signs in the sky and predictions in the stars. And these stories were included in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. But though the date of his death was well known, it was during the Jewish feast of the Passover, no date was ever given for his birth. Apparently, little attention was paid to it until Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire in the middle of the fourth century of our era. This was a time of fierce arguments over Jesus' identity. Was he an exalted but created being, or was he God's own self in human form? It's about this time that we begin to hear of public celebrations of Christmas, Christ Mass, towards the end of December, the time of the winter solstice, which was nine months from the spring equinox that marked the Passover and Jesus' death and resurrection. In some places, the date of Christmas fluctuated between December 25th and January the 6th, depending on shifts in calendars and customs and probably the whim of kings. Traditions from the winter festivals of other cultures, the Saturnalia of Rome, the Yule festivals of Northern Europe and the Celtic world were adapted and adopted into Christmas observances. The exchange of gifts, the decorations, the caroling, and many others that we now think of as being uniquely Christian. We hear a lot these days about there being a war on Christmas, a 
an effort to downplay its connection to Jesus' birth in favor of its more commercial or secular aspects, or to make it a winter holiday again. In fact, the first war on Christmas was probably waged by Christians, especially following the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, because the fiercest opponents of Christian celebrations were the Puritans, offshoots of my own tradition of Anglicanism who periodically succeeded in banning Christmas celebrations across the English-speaking world, all the way from the British Isles to the North American colonies. It took until the mid-19th century for many Americans to embrace Christmas again, and the Presbyterian Church of Scotland managed to keep Christmas off the country's list of public holidays from 1640 until 1958. But New Yorkers have always had a soft spot for Christmas. Our Dutch roots in the colony of Neue Amsterdam served to keep the Puritan disapproval of Christmas at a distance when the English took over. New Yorkers and Episcopalians, Washington Irving and Clement Clark Moore, contributed the stories of Old Christmas and the poem A Visit from St. Nicholas, which we know by its first line, "'Twas the night before Christmas." So by 1870, Christmas was formally declared to be a federal holiday. By the mid-20th century, the custom of exchanging gifts during the 12 days of Christmas turned into a months-long retail bonanza that threatens to drown the Christian observance of the birth of Jesus in a flood tide of conspicuous consumption. So you'll see stickers and signs declaring, keep Christ in Christmas about this time of year. But for many Christians, this isn't yet Christmas time. It's the season of Advent, a time of waiting and preparation, not for Jesus' birth as a baby, so much as it is for his second coming as King of Kings and Lord of creation. In Episcopal churches and in many others, Advent's blues and purples predominate until December 24th, when they're replaced by the gold and white of Christmas, lasting until January 6th, which is the Feast of the Epiphany. Now, my neighbors here in Peekskill probably find it odd that our tree doesn't go up at my house until Christmas Eve, and it doesn't come down until long after theirs is taken out with the Christmas Day trash. But I think this keeps us from the temptation to get bent out of shape when someone says, happy holidays or season's greetings. Because for us, Christmas Day becomes not the end of the season, but its beginning. It's also not simply Christmas Day, but the Feast of the Nativity, the celebration of the incarnation or becoming flesh of the Word or Logos of God in Jesus. So on Christmas Day, we skip over the star over Bethlehem and the angels and the shepherds, and we really go straight to the heart of Christmas. And that's in the first chapter of John's Gospel, which starts, in the beginning was the Word. Now, if that sounds a lot like the start of the book of Genesis, it should, because the birth of Jesus marks the beginning of a new humanity. Since Darwin's theory became accepted science, we've tended to act as though we believe nature's process of evolution ends with us. The top predator, the top of the food chain, the end goal of natural selection since the first living cell appeared on Earth. And I'm not quite certain that's true. As a species, we're a long way from Homo sapiens sapiens wise, wise human. In fact, I'm not at all sure we have yet fully achieved human being. It's interesting that the more recent translations of the Christian scriptures translate that phrase, the son of man, referring to Jesus as the human one. That's not a denial of Jesus' divinity, but it does point out something important. 
that in Jesus we see God, and we also see the fullness of humanity, the way human beings were always intended to be, totally aligned with God's purposes, congruent with God's character, compassionate and just, merciful and righteous, capable of all the emotions and actions of a normal human being, yet without sin, that is, without self-will, without crossing that line into willing and doing something contrary to the will of God. In fact, Christians believe Jesus is the will of God, the logos, the word, the intent of God for human beings, the firstborn of the finally human race into which we're transformed at the resurrection of the dead. The text of one of my favorite Advent and Christmas hymns may go back as far as 275 AD, and that's really before Christianity was legal. We know it as let all mortal flesh keep silence, and we sing it to a lovely French tune as we're receiving the bread and wine of the Eucharist. And the last couple of verses go like this. Rank on rank the host of heaven, spreads its vanguard on the way as the light of light descended from the realms of endless day that the powers of hell may vanish as the darkness clears away. At his feet the six-winged seraph, cherubim with sleepless eye, fail their faces to the presence, as with ceaseless voice they cry, Alleluia, Alleluia. Alleluia, Lord, most high. There is just something about those words, something that's so mysterious and awesome, that it really kind of gives me chill bumps every time I hear it, because I can see in my mind's eye that helpless newborn child wrapped in rough cloth and laid in an animal's feeding trough in a Middle Eastern backwater town. And yet at the same time, I can sense the presence of the glory that makes those cherubim and seraphim veil their faces before this little human being. That's what's remarkable about the Incarnation, the visible revealing in a human mortal of the immortal and invisible creator of us all. And the invitation to share in that life, now and forever and to the ages of ages. And that's what's wonderful about Christmas. I hope you'll, we'll see you at St. Peter's this year, 7 p.m. on Christmas Eve for our candlelight service, and 9 a.m. on Christmas Day for Holy Eucharist. Have a blessed Advent and Merry Christmas. I trust you enjoyed our program. From the Peekskill Human Relations Commission to the city of Peekskill and the surrounding areas, Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, and Happy Hanukkah. I wish everyone a safe, harmonious, holiday season.